All right, today we are going to be talking a little bit about your new organization in Lightroom CC. My name is Nicholas Papagallo and I put this presentation together for a talk at one of the Bay Photo Boots at WPPI and I wanted to record it and show you guys a little bit about how to start to look at organization a little bit differently. So we'll get right into it. Um, once again, my name is Nicholas Papagallo and I've been shooting since I'm about 12 years old. In the film days, I shot with my Pentax and Nikon cameras and I began shooting digital with a Canon 20D. I moved up through 20D, 30D, 40D, um, all the way through the uh, Mark III, 5D Mark III. And uh, I just recently switched out, actually out of, at, out of Chicago, um, this past June to a Lumix GH4 and I recently got a Lumix GX8 camera. So um, what I mostly like to shoot is landscapes, fine art, um, studio. I have a studio, Parkwood Studios, down here in Phoenix, Arizona and I love shooting uh, models and all kinds of people and stuff like that. Um, for about 20 years I was doing event photography and I'll still dabble in that a little bit if people ask and I love since I've been in Arizona Western photography so I like to go out and shoot the Old West and lots of uh, Old West people and subjects and cowboys stuff like that so uh, if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook you'll be able to see all of that um, a little bit of history of me in Lightroom 1 um, I started using Lightroom 1 and uh, I used it totally incorrectly and then I went out and got Lightroom 2 and continued to use it incorrectly of course it wasn't me so I got Lightroom 3 and still no no luck with it so I went out to Photoshop world for the week and just took all Lightroom classes and I just wanted to learn everything I could about this program and since then I've mastered as much as I can about Lightroom um, and the current version is now CC um, but I've had it all the way through 6 and now CC. Um, on another note, I run the PAC. It's the Photographer's Adventure Club. It's the largest camera club with over 35 chapters in Canada and the U.S. So check that out at photoadvclub.com. And I try to teach Lightroom every month here locally. I do a uh, think tank kind of class in the studio. Everyone gets together, asks me questions. I even learn stuff sometimes. It's great. So uh, I try to keep up to date on this so that I'm not rusty. So new workflow. So organization starts with how you're actually going to um, get the images in and what your workflow is at the beginning. So you kind of may have to rework a little bit of what you're doing. But um, my workflow, and this is abbreviated, is import sort the images, erase the rejects, post process which would be editing and then export them back out. What that looks like on a larger scale would be something like this. So put the CF card or SD card in, again import them, I also back them up at the same time to another 5 terabyte hard drive. So that happens um, immediately um, on my import. Then I start to, once they're all imported, I start to color sort the images. Um, the reason I do this is, again, to be organized, I don't want to have images all over the place. I want to have them a little bit more um, collected the way I, I want them. I want to do some other stuff to them. So I'll cull and sort them, and I will color code the images. So um, if you use stars or flags, just insert that there. Um, I personally like the color codes. Then I'll use the compare mode if I have images that are very close to really try to figure out what's going to work the best for me if the uh, the left image or the right image, you know, if there's slight differences in the smile, the eyes, stuff like that, background. So I use the compare mode and then I'll go ahead and delete the bad images. And when I delete them, I do not remove them from Lightroom. We'll get into this a little bit later. I actually delete them entirely. From that point on, we're going to make smart collections. So smart collections are going to auto-populate. We're going to show you how to do that. I will add keywords. And then, and you can see how far down the line this is, then post-processing slash editing will come in. So all of this stuff is either done automatically or I'm doing some of it manually. So um, I'm going to teach you how to think about this a little differently, hopefully, um, and then get your images organized and start to work on your older images. So I also want to let you know I do rename my images a lot of times and then 
export is your save. So in order to get stuff in and out of Lightroom, it's called import and export. So then I would save stuff out. So moving right along, import settings. So I wanted to bring up a couple different options that I just spoke about. So the backup is this first arrow up here on the top left. That's make a second copy to. Now the backup in Lightroom does not, it's actually before everything else is done. So it does not take into account or sync any of your images that you've deleted, color coded, that kind of stuff. This is strictly a backup from the actual CF or SD card. One thing to make sure when you're doing this backup is to actually make sure it goes to a different hard drive. It's going to default to your main laptop or computer hard drive. You want to change that and actually move that so that you can, if something gets stolen, it gets burnt out, your hard drive goes bad, you have a fire, you don't want to have everything in one place. Rename your files. So you can do this on import right here by checking this off, but you can also do it on export or right before export. So I do not do the renaming files, but if you want to do them right away, you can click it right there. Moving down the left side, you have metadata. So what you want to do is make a metadata preset so that everything is done on import. So my metadata preset has my copyright settings in there, has all of my other info about me, phone numbers, contact info. All that's automatically put on and I would do that little drop down, click it and it's going to say none right now and then I would click mine and put it in there. Keywording is important. Lightroom works off of keywords and all your metadata. So if you have no keywords attached to anything and you're looking for a seal that you shot in like 1996, you're not going to be able to find that without manually searching. So on this level, you want to put global keywords in. This is everything that you actually shot at the shoot. So if you don't, if you didn't shoot all seals, don't type the word seal in there because it's going to go to everything else as well. So be careful with the keywording at this level, very global. The whole shoot, I, I use the zoo as an example. The At this level, it would be like zoo, Phoenix Zoo, Phoenix, Arizona, animals. But I would not get to specific animals at this point because I'm, it's going to hurt me later. Moving up to the top right arrow, we have your fub, subfolders in there and you want to change, and we're going to get into this a little more, I believe, later on. You want to change, check this off and change it to an actual subfolder name. So I typed the word test in there. And right below that, you want to have organize set to into one folder. And if you look below, you're going to see the actual test with the little plus and italicized down below. So that's how my organization starts and it's going to build all of the stuff for me with checking a few check boxes off. So here's a closer view. I check that off. Do not let it do not let it actually pick date by you for you. It's going to be defaulted to sort by date. What that's going to do is make you 365 folders it could be you shot one picture yesterday, but it's going to make a folder for it. So that one is strictly by date, the date that's on your metadata, and it's going to keep making those folders. If your date's wrong in your camera, it's even going to be worse. So make sure you change this so that you can actually type in there, you know, San Diego 2016, and then it'll actually type that in for you. And you'll know in 2016, you went to San Diego, it's going to be easier for you to find. You'll be able to search that later. So we spoke about sorting your image out, which is also known as culling. I do this in the loop mode. The keyboard command for loop mode is E for enlarge. And you're going to have thumbnails across the bottom of the page. And what I do is I put my three fingers on six, seven, and eight. Those are the color codes for red, yellow, green, and nine is blue. So these are totally defined by you as an artist of what you want them to actually mean. So for me, red means delete. That would be six. Seven, which is yellow, is need some editing or I like something about it. I'm not sure what. Green is a keep or pick, something I'm going to edit. And then my blue, I just recently started using. That's number nine. 
that's uploaded already, processed for sale, stuff like that. So I'm actually already selling that. So then I know when I go back and edit, maybe I edit a different version that it's not the one that um, I don't want to edit that again or change that in any way. Gray can also be a color. That's your default gray that the, all the icons look like. And that's just skipped or unsure. So I don't actually have a color code for it. And uh, you want to be quick with this. This isn't something you want to, if you're starting to think about stuff and say, oh, do I really like this? Do I not like it? Then it's probably a red or a yellow or a delete, you know. So you want to be very quick, like next, 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 next. So on that note, we're going to next. So why I think the colors are a better system, the colors to me are, we're photographers, we're artists, we're visual. So looking at this screen, I can see exactly how much work I have to do. I can see the one on the left is a red, the one on the right is a green. The reason I don't use the purple, it's too close to the blue. So the lower left is purple, the lower right is blue, and then gray I left in the middle there. And you can see on the gray one how small the stars are. So to me, to look at an entire screen and try to find stars at the very bottom was kind of just, it just seemed like I wanted to have something that was popping off the screen. So again, make your own decisions of what you think will work or will not work for yourself. So, but earlier I, I mentioned to erase the reds and by that there, you're gonna have a couple different options. You can erase or remove them. And I'll show you that screen right here in the bottom lower corner in a second. But I wanted to tell you how to erase the reds because there's really no, no one tells you how to do this. So in the grid mode, you have, you hit G and it's gonna bring up all your images. You have frames around that have colors. I go up to the edit menu at the very top on your top bar, as you see in the picture to the right there, and you select by color label. So you scroll down, select by color label, and then red. And then you simply hit the delete button. Now this is part of organization because you need to get rid of decluttering everything. So if you just keep all your images, now this may change depending on the type of photography that you are doing. If you're doing something like a wedding and you need to keep those reds in case the client wants something later on, then do not delete them at this point. But for my landscape, fine art, all my stuff that I'm doing personally, it gets trashed, I throw it away. So after you click select color label by red, you hit the delete button on your keyboard, this lower left image is gonna pop up. And it's gonna say delete the selected master photo from disk or just remove it from Lightroom. Now the remove is blinking. It's like pulsating and blinking usually and it's like click me, click me, but you don't wanna do remove. If you click remove, it's going to remove the icons and your previews from Lightroom only. It will not delete the file. So your file is gonna be stuck in cyberspace there. So you wanna do delete from disk and it's gonna say, are you sure the first time? And you say, yes, I'm sure. And then you can get rid of that message after a while. But um, that will actually delete it from the hard drive. So as I'm erasing the reds, what I want to try to do is get all the yellows and other ones green eventually. And now this is probably way too um, overzealous for me. I have hundreds of thousands of photos and I'm not gonna ever get them all green, but I can try and I, I work on my newer images as I move forward and try to you know keep onto a great workflow. So it may take a little post-processing. It may mean using Photoshop or it may mean using other view modes. So right now we're gonna go into what's survey mode. So survey mode is you select two or more photos and you can hit the keyboard command N or down in the lower left, you'll see the icon that I, I made a bigger version of and that brings you to survey. So that brings up a series of images. If you go above six at one time, they get too small so it becomes kind of the same as your grid size. So there's no purpose in doing it. So if you select four to six images and that's it and you can see the little matrix it puts up. Now what I'll do is I'll go through these images and see if there's one I like better. Do I like to see the crowd like the lower left? Do I like to see no crowd, just the laser like the upper right? Do I want a people one is kind of irrelevant to this series. So that one's kind of showing you that it doesn't work when you start to add irrelevant pictures in there. So 
when I go through, I keep the pictures very similar in the similar series. I wouldn't include that lower right one that you see there. I would include the first three and then maybe a few other ones that look like that. And what I'm doing is trying to see them all side by side so I can really decide which one I like. There's a little X setting when you hover over them on one of the corners and you can click that and get rid of one from the series and the rest will get larger. And this is just a way to a different viewing mode besides the grid to actually see everything. The next viewing mode is compare mode. So you select the photo, the starting photo, and you click the letter C on your keyboard and that's going to bring up the next consecutive picture. So again, you want to have pictures that are similar. I'm looking at facial expressions in this. I'm looking at smiles. I'm looking at details. Um, if I wanted to zoom in on Michelle's eye here, I can click on the left one. It will also zoom on the right one. So as I look at this mode, the left picture is my selected best image. Then if you look at the arrow below on the right there, I can actually switch the images if I want to and then keep going. So I will go through with my right arrow key and only my right image will change, my candidate. When I find one better, I will click the switch one, the X to Y left only, and it actually makes that my select and then I can keep going. When the images change and they're no more, re they're not relevant anymore, then I would actually move on and just pick that's my favorite one out of the series. So what this does is it lets you look at details, so you can actually see details. You can zoom in close up to details. If you're on a laptop or a smaller screen, I suggest hitting Shift and Tab. That's going to make it larger for you. And again, in your organizational process, this is helping you hone down to get your best images little tiny details like hairs, eyes, poses, shadows, stuff like that is what I look for in there. When you're done, you can actually hit the done button on the bottom right and it will close out. Before you hit done, pick which one is your select, mark it green or five stars and then hit the done button. Here's the example of how not to use compare. These two pictures are not the same. You're not comparing anything in it. so. Um, this is an old screenshot from one of my old presentations and I always thought it was funny that I, this, these came up and I screenshot it at like 3 in the morning redoing something and this is not how you use it. On to keywording. So Lightroom is based on keywords. You could make your images very searchable or very hard to find. It's going to be the most powerful when you keyword everything well. You have a couple different ones. We've already talked about global keywording. Now you have general and specific keywords. So you're, we're going to get into how to generally do stuff and then specific. So there's three different ways to add. We did the global. This is on the right side here how you can do some general ones for the series. So you can select a bunch of images by holding shift down and selecting the first one and last one and then you could type in 2014 comma bay photo comma bay photo lab as you see on the right there and so forth and so on but now if you have a lot of images that are very different um, I don't always use this just white space to type everything in you can use common misspellings too so if um, say portrait is always spelled incorrectly you can type it both ways so that people can find it because this is used in Google as well when you bring everything online this is the easier keywording to get very specific. So I use the paint can tool. So you can actually undock the spray can. It's in the grid mode on the bottom bar. You'll see it down there. You can see the picture at the very top next to the word keywording up here. And you're going to check off in the um, little box there that says keywords. You're going to check that off that says keywords and you're going to start to type keywords in the box to the right with commas between them and then you can actually go and spray on your grid keywords. So you're not spraying paint, you're not spraying any other effect, you're, sp you're spraying keywords. So as you start to spray keywords, you can click a single image or you can start on the center of one image and then drag across the images. So as you drag across, if you look at number 85 there, you can see the white box that goes around it you'll start to see the white boxes go around and 80, the next one has 86, 87. So they start to get those white 
borders are right around the image and I'll just drag them, drag them, drag them and then when it changes then I will go down to the bottom, change my keywords again in the box down here where it says test, test one, test two, test three and change the keywords and then keep spraying. Super easy, you can do lots, you can start to get the feel for how fast you can go because if you miss one it won't have that white box around the end of your trim there so be sure that that white box pops up. More organization tips. So I want to clean my interface up. If you're shooting a lot of the same images, you want to clean them up a little bit with stacking. So if you see where the red arrow is here, it has one of three. So I have three variations of this one raw file. So the one is my raw original file with no editing. And then I did a desaturated grungy look to the right that's selected. And then I did a black and white look. So I don't need to see all of those at all times. I'm able to click that one of three and it will stack them and hide them underneath each other. So it will look like this. You can also do auto stack by capture time. Now when would this come in handy in your organizational workflow is if you're doing all kinds of time lapses or other different photos where you're shooting lots of images. So that's actually found by right clicking anywhere on the grid in your image, stacking, you come down to stacking right in the middle there and then auto stack by capture time. If you're doing something that's very high speed, you can set it to two or three seconds and anything within that parameter is going to be stacked automatically. It's not always correct, but it is pretty good when you start to play with that slider. So what to stack? Things I stack are HDR series. I stack model shoots because you're shooting a lot of the same model in the same pose quickly sometimes. Sports burst mode, definitely. You don't need to see the football moving through the air you know, every fraction of an inch. Group or family shots, cropped virtual copies. So if you have different versions of virtual copies, you can put those in. Black and white versions, virtual copies, and of course, time-lapse images. Now when they're stacked, it looks like where the red arrow is here, where you'll see like the stacked papers, and it'll tell you how many photos are in that stack. So this stack has three photos in it. So you may be asking what a virtual copy is, but since I just mentioned that, it is another way that it's a little bit better to organize stuff in Lightroom versus Photoshop. So in Photoshop, I'd have to make all real copies. All my copies were real hard copies and you'd have to start to try to figure out which copy was which and which one you crops the, you know, an ex-boyfriend out of, stuff like that. Here you can keep your raw file and you make virtual copies. So you would go down, you would right click, right under stacking it says create virtual copy. And that would pop up automatically stacked, it's going to pop up to the right of your raw copy. So your raw copy is going to be, everything is actually pointing to the raw copy and then this virtual copy hardly takes up any room. As you change the settings in there, they save right on that, but they're actually still talking to the main raw file. You don't have a second real hard copy. So you can make as many of these as you want for different looks, different crops, all different reasons, and uh, I do this quite often. So what is the old way that I used to organize everything? So the old way, is folders. So you change your custom folder on import. We had talked about that and the folder is your whole shoot. So but the shoot could have many different elements to it and you may want to pull out your favorites and different things like that. So folders are great for the entire shoot but when I start to actually go in and do my favorites I don't make subfolders anymore. So um, what I do do is I actually make collections and collections can be from many different folders without actually moving my original files. So this in this instance here I have models 2014 then I have all my model shoots listed 1, 2014, 3 and it says so we have the one there highlighted that's 2, 2014 Vincent which was from this shoot prior right here and we want to say put one of these in my best of collection. I don't want to go out and drag it out of here. I want it to stay in those 48 images that you see there. 
So what I would do is I actually would go and make a collection and those would be a collection of my favorite model shoots from 2014 or favorite black and whites or favorite male models, whatever you want to name it, I would actually do that. So this is how Lightroom deals with making albums and everything. And it's actually a lot better than the old way because the old way I would either have to make two copies, say I had a flower and I wanted to move it into best of flowers. Now I had two. And if I edited one, how do I remember which one I edited? Did I edit the original? Did I edit the best of? How do I update it? This way they're all auto updated. When you edit a picture and it's in a collection, it will be auto updated. And now with Lightroom Mobile, it's auto updated on my portfolio, on my iPad and on my iPhone. So they both will show up there. And I, when I'm showing someone, they're ready to go. You can also show clients your called images. So you can go through your Lightroom. If I shoot tethered and I was shooting Vincent and I actually want to go through really quick and only show him the best of ones, I can go through, make a collection very quickly by selecting, there's the little circles on your upper right hand corner of your images as you go over them, those add them to your collection. And I can build a very quick set of images to show Vincent and then he only sees my best work or a client or whomever. I use them for portfolios, especially with Lightroom Mobile now. It's the only way to go. And that's a free program you can download from Adobe. And again, those images stay in their original folders, so nothing is going to move out of the way. Smart Collections is the next level of collections, and they don't work for everything. What they do work for is, if you look on my side there, on the left side, I have colored green, colored red, colored yellow, five star, no copyright. Those are great collections to use as smart collections. These auto populate the second something is colored green, it will go to 62 on the left side there. And then something else is colored green, it just filters them into these folders instantaneously. It takes less than a second. So this way I can go down to no copyright and if it says zero, I'm great. If it says 2000, I know I have to go in and add my metadata preset to that all those images. So this helps me find stuff that may be missing. Video files is another great one you see down below there. Without keywords is a great one. So you can go back and start to add keywords to images that you need to. So smart collections are great. You make it with the collections bar where the red hour is. You hit the plus sign and you say create smart collections and you could add parameters to those. So we're getting a little bit more organized now but you, I used to like to name all my files. Now with keywording and collections, I do not do this as, mo more, as much anymore, but I do do it if I have a client so that they have their name on the actual images. So if I'm shooting Mark and Mary's wedding, I can type it in Mark and Mary 2016 and rename those so that they actually have everything in there. So that's why I do it. Um, I do it before export as well because I want to make sure that the client has the same image names and numbers as I do. So when they order something or ask me to reprint something that I can actually go in and find it. So if mine are image 001 and theirs are Mark and Mary 001 that may not connect to be the same 001. They may number them differently. So you have to be careful about that. So I bring up the rename. You can highlight all the images and hit F2 or function F2 and it will bring up your actual file renaming. It is in the top menu as well if you go up there. And I want to make sure that the client feels like they received all the images. So this is why I do it on export. So a bride likes to get every single image that, that was taken. Every single image that you took is not awesome. So no matter what photographer, whomever it is, you're shooting fast, you're shooting in dark situations, whatever it may be, their eyes are closed, you do not need to deliver those images even though they ask you to. So I would like to change it, delete all my bad ones, make sure that they get all the edited images. So this is what I do, I would type it in. I have a custom one, so my year pop auto populates and my number auto populates. So all I have to do is type in, like you see there it says Alfonso, I typed it in, the rest happens for me. It's very simple 
you can just go and put that in um, and make a preset for that if you choose to do so. Moving on. All right, setting up an identity plate. So this helps me figure out which actual catalog I'm in. So I set up identity plate so that I have different catalogs in my workflow for family, for personal, and for my actual work stuff. So I wanna be able to have that pop up and this is how I do it. So I have it pop up so I can see right off the bat whether it's my personal, my family, or my other work one. So you go to identity plate setup and your identity plate setup pops up and you could type in there my name, your company name, whatever you wanna type in there. You can actually put a graphic in there as well and then you do a save as and each one of my catalogs then has a different title on it. So I know my the one that says family is my family photos. I can't open it by mistake and import stuff hastily late at night. I'll see it and know right off the bat. So just another way to help organize. I do not use a ton of multiple catalogs. I just have those three. I had a different workflow where I started to make more, but with Lightroom Mobile, now I only have the one personal catalog that I that I keep. Moving on to metadata. So you have no reason to add your camera metadata because all of the EXIF data is put in there automatically. You can use the paint can we talked about with a preset and put those in there. And then you can spray it on to spray your metadata on there as well. The same exact way you did keywording. Um, I do add a title and caption because it pops up in Facebook as well. And then I actually do save a metadata preset. If you look to the right, you can see some of the information I put in there. This is an old screenshot, but you get the idea. So I put my copyright in there and it says copyright 2016, it would say now. Nicholas Papagala Photography, all rights reserved. I put myself as the creator. I checked the copyright status off as copyrighted. The green label is coming from me labeling it green. And then all my camera information is down below there. So in that title and caption area is where you would title and caption it if you were gonna turn it blue and put it out for publication so that it that went on to Fine Art America, all the other things, uh, 500 pics, Facebook, all that stuff. And this is what it looks like. This is the actual screen where you have everything. So on this, you see my address is missing. I leave the address out on purpose because I didn't want to have crazy brides banging on my door the next day asking where their pictures were. So I, I want you to look at also where it says write usage terms. I have not for commercial use without written permission. And the reason that I put this in there is when you shoot someone like a client or a bride and they're going to go out and get those images personally, they paid for your services, but they did not pay for you to be able to go out and let them sell the image to bridal magazines to put on the cover or something. They have to come back to you for commercial use and ask you for permission or ask you if you want to get paid for it. That's still your images. So unless you give away your rights of your images, then you want to put this in there. You can pause it at this point and actually write this all down or type it into your Lightroom if you're following along. The reason I do put my phone number and email and website is I want to get more clients. And when this goes up online, if someone is looking at the metadata, this will pop up there. So at this point, we can have questions. But since this is not a live presentation, you can put questions down below in the comment section. And I will check in weekly and see if I can help and answer any other questions to help you get a little bit more organized. And here is all my current contact information. So once again, I had a great time um, teaching this for you and I hope you picked up a few organizational tips. If you have other organiza organizational tips, please put them down below in the comments. I'd love to hear what you do. It always helps me to see what others are doing out there and how I can do it better. So once again, this is Nicholas Papagallo and you could uh, email me any information or questions as well. Thank you and have a good day.